Thank you very much, Max. Our next contributor is uh, uh, Mr. Dinesh Tampi, who is Vice President of Tata Consultancy Services and the, uh, the head of the uh, Regional Distribution Center and a long time uh, person who cooperates with the center and also uh, participates in the classes as a resource person in the business integrity class. And he was also influential, actually, it depended on him that uh, the center received an in-kind contribution of at least 200,000 US dollars from TCS to help us monitor and evaluate our own activities in this so-called Siemens project. Dinesh? Okay. Thank you, Professor. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to be here. And I am privileged and honored to be here in this audience. And I will just touch upon briefly about the overall concept of integrity. And also, like I think one <coughs> of the aspects is whether it's good or bad, what are our limits, and basically how we do in Tata Consultancy Services and, uh, and the uh, process and the procedures which we follow. So basically, as all of us know, I think it has been touched upon uh, quite frequently in these uh, discussions about the various virtues of integrity. Like it has to be honesty, trustworthiness, and um, in fact, like whatever you stand for, you have to like boldly stand for that and um, uh, means basically whatever may be the consequences, you have to ensure that you stand for that virtue. In fact, integrity <coughs> as a word, if you look from a Latin meaning, it's a wholeness. So it's not just like somebody who talks the talk, but also walks the talk. And specifically, I think that point was also mentioned earlier. In fact, integrity comes in like three different ways. If in my view, it's like personal integrity, the family integrity, and the societal integrity. The first one is much more easier because it confines only to you, and like whatever consequences comes up, that person has to handle it. But when it comes to a family integrity, like in fact each and every member of the family has to have that integrity ingrained in them, what we call as the family values. And when it comes to societal scenario, it's much more complicated. You not only have to have the family norms and uh, uh, values plus the societal norms which we like continue from generation to generations. So that's where like the conflict or the clash happens whether to follow integrity, how we will follow and what are all the limits. In fact, when you talk about the limits, I feel like it comes with the context. In some of the cases where uh, the question comes up, okay, if you like consciously sidestep some of the integrity aspects, what are all the limits or can we sidestep that? So that's where, in fact, like our earlier chairman, Mr. Ratan Data, used to say, in fact, one of the deals, the Air India, which is the national airlines of India, was the government decided to, again, uh, go private, and the bid was put in. And in fact, like one of the ministers, I think, um, asked him about the whatever X number of, uh, X amount of money. And like, once he was traveling, uh, his co-passenger asked him, so like, why can't you just pay that money? Obviously, Data Group being the chairman, he could have paid that money and like got the deal. In fact, that whole process was scrapped because everybody pulled out of the deal. And then he said, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm very sure I will have a peaceful night's sleep. So practicing integrity definitely has its own virtues. You will have like that uh, peacefulness and uh, how we can run the business that matters. <coughs> And again, how we put the checks and balances is what comes into play. In fact, TCS being the flagship company of Tata Group, is in fact, like we have close to around 300,000 employees. And in fact, Tata Group is like 550,000 plus. And like how will we, in fact, uh, Tata Group is a philanthropic trust. It is run by a philanthropic trust. 66% of its profits is plowed back into the society, mainly in three areas, education, health, and environment. So within that, like we have like our checks and balances, data code of conduct, all those things in place. But like from the, in fact, like for TCS, our CEO is the overall ethics in charge. Whatever happens, like it comes, you know, goes to him. 
And from that perspective, it is drilled down. I think it was many a times discussed or mentioned here, like it should start from the top. So he and his leadership team ensures that the integrity aspect of it is well followed and it is put in place. There are checks and balances, but still the challenge is being a global company operating in like 40, 45 different countries and having different cultures, how will we implement it to the last level? So that is where like we put in practices, in fact, like when the induction, in fact, that point was touched upon. When we do the induction, the first itself, whomever joins, whether fresh or experienced, they have to go through the Tata Code of Conduct. In fact, like a session specifically is conducted to ensure that they go through it, they understand and they sign that Tata Code of Conduct. So that's how the process is still okay. There can be exceptions and def definitely the HR will come into play and like whomever does that has to undergo severe consequences. So as um, earlier it was mentioned, it's not worth to do something sidestepping and trying to do things outside of that. So overall, like, in fact, like some of the instances where like we do, we can consciously do that if it's for the benefit of the larger society. In fact, one of the bits, in fact, I was personally involved, we did that at a lower price because it, uh, it was considering the farmers. It was a cardamom auction. And there was a buyer's cartel who was controlling the price and the farmers were not getting enough of whatever like for the even for their survival. They were planning to kill the crop. And in fact, like many of the parts of India, cardamom is one and, and I think all of you know that it's one of the popular spices which gets exported. So that's where like this whole outcry system was um, demolished and the chairman of spices board decided to go in for an electronic auction. So it's like you sit in front of the uh, uh, laptops or PCs and then do the auction. Nobody knows what is the price. And it's like last six to seven years it's running and it's benefiting the uh, farmers very much. In fact, the same tool we have implemented over there and it's working very well. So that was a first of a kind uh, implementation of the bid we went in and overall the deal value like was uh, uh, reduced so that we ensure that it gets uh, larger, it uh, means in the impact is much positive for the larger part of the farmers. So those are some of the instances which come upon. And again, I think like one of the aspect I want to touch is from a CIBG, the program, it's really, I think it's, a, in fact, I have been in the focus groups and some of the discussions. It's like a great thing because you are like giving practical insights to whomever going to be the future managers or entrepreneurs and then they will really get that <laughs> insight as to how they can practice it or what, what the limits are on how you can um, uh, like see where the limit is. So it's basically I think it's a great program and I think I'm happy to be as an organization and myself to be a part of that and uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Now I would like to give the floor to another uh, all-time friend and contributor to our program, so much a contributor that uh, he's also developed a, a special course on the topic he will speak about. It's uh, Mr. Uh, Nick uh, Salvari, uh, who is a Canadian, Hungarian, and uh, he runs a risk assessment company here in Hungary and uh, in London. and. Uh, is, among other duties, the uh, the president of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce here in London. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to be trying. To, I'm going to try and be brief um, and, and try and focus on on a contribution here that puts into context what the business school has been doing and looks at it from the perspective of a practitioner. I am a practitioner. I this is what I do. Is we look at integrity. Um, I'm a practitioner, but I'll tell you, I've never paid a bribe. Um, people tell me I don't experience the opportunity to pay a bribe because they're afraid of what I might do. Um, that's interesting. It's possible. I've never, ever been in a situation where I've ever had to pay a bribe. But I'll tell you, with this, if this works, does this work? Ah, yes, of course. The big blue button, which I always forget to press. <coughs> Um, with, with, with this sort of situation, this conference, this whole discussion has been focused on really what is going on with bribery. We've been trying to skirt around the discussion of what it is, has it changed, what's the situation at all with it? Do people pay bribes? Is it getting better? Isn't it getting better? I have good news to report. It's getting a lot better. Why? Because 
I see the kinds of inquiries coming to us changing quite fundamentally now. Um, in the last five years, it's become quite obvious to me that we're not so much interested in basic bits of information about who's from where and what they've done, um, but it's whether do I want to do business with them, do I want to be seen talking to them. It's, it's a very, very different scenario right now. Compliance driven, probably law driven. I'll speak more about this, but I do see that rec uh, we have to recognize that business is changing. The questions I asked of, of Gregor have to come to that as well. So what do we see in the future? Um, during the break, I asked him, uh, very frankly, how was, how was the last time you spoke about this uh, in public like this, the experience that you have? Or, or Max here telling us that, yes, he's paid bribes in Sudan. We should talk about that. Um, <laughs> how many times have people in the last five years done that? And the five years prior to that? It's changing. It's becoming something that we can put the boots on the table and discuss it, which is a very, very positive aspect of this. And it's actually the impact of not just legislation, but programs like what the CEU now is engaged in. It's about research. It's about raising the awareness to anybody that's in business that, yes, it's, it doesn't pay off. It's dangerous. It's risky. You might get fined. But it actually raises other concerns about why it happens. Davida's work on, on cultural anthropology and this aspect in business is a phenomenally interesting aspect because what we look at as a business studying or collecting intelligence is what we do, we're the business spies, I suppose, is that we look at what the risks are of culture. What's it like to do business in Africa? What's it like to do business in Kazakhstan? Do we really know who we're up against and who we're talking to? And it's up to guys like us who've been doing this for years to come back and say, you know, I see something I've seen before. I see trends. I see things that need to be looked at in a different light. There are some hard lessons to be learned still. Um, you know, I've got a list of fines that have been paid. Those aren't the hard lessons. It's building a business and finding out that after 20 years of building it, it's been dis decimated and you're not going to work again because your reputation as a business person has been destroyed. Um, I'll give you a very interesting explanation or what I mean by that. Integrity is not just about corruption and bribery. Just this last week, the babysitter that looks after my baby um, was brought up by another friend of mine. And that person's baby is also looked after by this person. And they called up and said, do you know what? A receipt fell out of this person's pocket. And they had bought a two deciliter bottle of vodka that morning, just before they came to look after this little girl. Do you think she drinks? What do you do? Do we confront? Do we not confront? Do we find out? Is it, is it important? Now, the network of people that is involved, she's never going to work again. Does it matter if she drinks? The fact of the matter is, is that it doesn't matter if she drinks. It's the perception that she might. Because she might put my son in a car and drive him in the morning to a playground drunk. And I'm not prepared to take the risk that she's not drunk. You, my friend confronted this woman, who of course denied it, which was predictable. And now the situation has started. And within a very short period of time, Unfortunately, because there's no recourse for this, that person's integrity is going to be completely decimated. Now, if you're a big corporation called WorldCom, if you're an investor like Madoff was, or you're a babysitter, integrity is a factor of what, you know, how well you look after that element of it. So that was a, a dumb thing to do. But how many situations are there out there where politicians or business leaders have made decisions that have been dumb things to do? And you know, the, the, the fact is, is that there will be other hard lessons to learn. Um, new trends and behaviors are appearing with an impact on integrity. Um, look at the behavior of some of the big auditors, for example. One of the examples I will have um, is a very, very recent thing that we were involved with, where a large company with involvements in, I think, 36 different countries, big, big money. I mean, these guys have billions in revenues had a very, very small situation in a, in a Central European country where they thought that there was a bribe being paid, there was something happening. We were brought in to investigate. And yeah, there was about three or 400,000 euros of risk. It wasn't proven that it happened, but there was risk. Now, what instigated the investigation? And that's what's interesting. That's what's leading to a trend. Had that company not engaged in the investigation to determine what was going on, their global auditor, had actually threatened to suspend 
the audit globally. They didn't want to be associated with a company that wasn't prepared to look into how far this thing went. At the end of the day, the 300,000 probably works out 2.000001% of their revenue. But it was the threat that millions of, of dollars of impact of re-auditing a company globally, finding another auditor, the press, all of it, and potentially raising the, the, the interest of the SEC as the RSEC registered, um, was enough for, for the auditor to step back from this whole situation. I think if we roll the clock back to Enron or things like that, um, you know, back then this wasn't the case. Today it is the case. Okay. Um, other trends and behaviors. Um, some of the things that I see is that companies waste incredible amounts of time when trying to make a decision with character and integrity. The problems that companies face today are that they spend, well, let's say that the incident, the whistleblower, whatever you want to call it, in whichever language it is, the spy, whatever it is, it's the girlfriend, it's the wife, it's whatever it is that has made that, that sort of claim that somebody has paid a bribe whatever the case is, or somebody's been engaged in corruption. Is there something that's been happening? Well, typically what happens is the senior management gets together, the board sits together, and they sit and they ponder. What is the option? What can I do? And this is what I think is one area where focus hasn't been. In teaching integrity and in teaching uh, how to actually look at these things, one of the bits of focus of the course I'll be teaching is collecting enough information for a board to actually make a decision effectively. What do I do in this situation? We have five whistleblower letters. Do we investigate? It implicates one of the senior managers in the company in that region. It implicates a deal which is worth a lot of money to the company. A fine could be huge. Just last week I had breakfast with a corporate lawyer who said to me that the best solution, put it under the carpet and hope for the best. Well. Two years after hoping for the best, two years after trying to hide it, two years after changing the evidence, eliminating evidence, mm, hoping people forget, somebody will knock on the door. And that didn't happen 10 years ago. But now somebody will knock on the door because somebody will be fired, because somebody will raise the awareness of it, because somebody will have coffee with a journalist one morning and the news will come out. And can you as a business leader, and this is one of the most important aspects of this, defend what you did five years ago. Can you remember what you did last week? I can't. I got no idea what I did this morning. I have to check my iPhone. What did I, why did I meet with that person? Asked the SEC investigator. I've got no idea. I don't remember. Well, you met with them because the forensics are that capable to determine what your schedule was five years ago. Who did you meet? Where were you? Oh, your phone records are very, very good at that. Just ask Mr. Snowden. He'll tell you. Everything is available these days. So before you make the decision as to whether you engage in the bribe or not, or engage in the corruption or not, like you said, Gregor, very, very wisely, which is, you know, you don't do it. That's the character of it. But the fact of the matter is that today, you've got to go one step further, and that has to prove that you did everything you needed to do to make sure that you've defended the decision with integrity. And that is a very different situation today than it was 10 years ago. Nick? Yeah, I'm almost done. So um, changes to thinking and education are uh, critical for the future. What the impact is of teaching this is thinking. It's about students that go through a program, program like this that become aware of the types of tools that we can actually provide. So if it's corporate intelligence, for example, corporate intelligence is very very tacitly understood. Students should go through MBA programs and come away and know exactly what to expect of a practitioner. What's the contribution to a compliance program? And why is it not enough to put somebody who has a limited amount of respect in the company into a compliance position and how to get the snake through the, the maze, if you will? These are the kinds of things that case studies allow. These are the kinds of things that engaging students in cases where they're actually working in groups will allow. And I think it's a major, major deviation to what MBA courses have done up until now. The fact that the program has made this available because of the Siemens Fund, which happened because of a, a terrible case, we all know that, um, is, is evidence that things are changing. So I'm a lot more optimistic about it. And
privilege to be part of it. Thank you. Last but not least, of course, uh, our next panelist is Dr. Yudit uh, Budai, uh, uh, a practicing uh, lawyer uh, and uh, having vast amount of experience uh, concerning corporate fraud and related issues. And she also participates in uh, what we call executive panels at, at our MBA uh, integrity course. So, Judith, thanks for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I will not really abusively use the time, so I will try to be short. And I can be so, because actually, I can actually reflect on all the previous speakers, because I, I chose a topic, <coughs> which is a downgrade, which we heard from uh, Alex and I mean before that they are using as a toolkit to show you really how uh, a downgrade simulation can really be a very useful tool to teach to uh, future managers, uh, what to be prepared for, what's the good and bad, and how to make decisions in connection with very important uh, integrity questions and, and how to manage those. So, uh, I will have a look at the dawn raid with the spotlight of the manager's responsibility. And uh, just to make clear what is I'm talking about, what is dawn raid, what I'm talking about, because it's not typically a bribery um, issue, but it's more like a competition authorities with a uh, warrant, a court warrant in their hand, can virtually go to any company who is a suspect of an alleged uh, cartel, for example, what you mentioned before, uh, price fixing or maybe bid rigging. So in that context, it can be actually um, something to do with, with uh, uh, bribery in terms of, uh, for example, having an underlying case where there was a, a public entity who was issuing a bid and certain bidders were first of all liaising before bidding or maybe even bribing the uh, the, the issuer, how to, to issue and then how to select among them, uh, or maybe just uh, uh, allocating or splitting the, the territory for the purposes of, of uh, having advantages on the market. So these are normally the cartel cases whereby their kind of down rates are uh, starting. And what I really want to have a look uh, via three questions. Uh, how uh, and what sort of challenges managers face and, and really uh, what to be prepared for and basically a bit uh, summarizing all what we heard uh, earlier. So, um, in case of a down rate, the question is really first uh, how, how a down rate may start. We heard earlier that there could be informators, there could be kind of whistleblowers who go to the authority and report. And who are these whistleblowers? As we heard, the insiders, mainly employees or uh, business partners. And why they become whistleblowers? Because they were not well treated. They are uh, either the, either the uh, human resource management was, was <coughs> badly made by the managers or, or the, the, per, the certain business uh, uh, contacts or, or uh, were, were badly managed and they are dissatisfied with the way how the company, the managers, uh, the responsible people at the company treated them. Uh, the question is, uh, if we look at whether it's good or bad to have whistleblowers and to, to have regulate all these schemes, by the way, uh, the, the whistleblowers, uh, in connection with the whistleblowers element, the, the human factor obviously have to be considered because they are sometimes the the kind of whistleblowers like this get a kind of little uh, fee for, for being uh, blowing the whistle, 1%, for example, of the entire uh, sanction. Anyway, so uh, is it good or not good to have a whistleblower? I think generally, from the corporation's pr perspective, it's, it's obviously bad because they were badly treated. But obviously, from the uh, uh, perspective of the society, it is good because it's really helping uh, to, to clean the company and keep the company clean. And just as you very well said earlier, uh, because you can always uh, have, get in a situation that there will be a whistleblower, it's better if less people know about what you are doing or you just don't do things bad or you just do things clean and, and perfectly. So that can be certainly one aspect which, which definitely gives a feedback on this. The other question is, uh, what uh, actually uh, there is one additional thing that, that how a down rate may start. Leniency, you, you also mentioned self reporting. So you can, for example, see in, in um, lots of cartels, mainly 
actually Korean, Chinese companies, many of them come to the European Union, for example, to make leniency applications with big, big global cartels, just to be the first in line to self-report, in which case, if they really give valuable content for the authority, they escape from the fine, which is really good. Why it can be good? In many jurisdictions, for example, if you escape from the fine, you can still be uh, a party to a, a public procurement uh, because then it's not an excluding factor for you. So it really can be a very self-cleaning mechanism to be a, or, or, or basically market cleaning mechanism to be a, a, a leniency applicant. And then the others are lining up and they are helping the authority because they get 30% discount or 50% discount or whatever, whichever they are in the line. Okay, so then the second question is what happens in a dawn rate? The dawn rate in itself is a very frightening thing because uh, maybe a bunch of people, even a policeman comes in and then what happens, obviously everybody is frightened or, or having discomfort in a certain place where the, the, this big group of people come in. And I think one of the most important thing is how, how the employees, even from the receptionist, is, is trained for this possible situation. And whether the number one manager is on, on, on the spot or how accessible that person is or how it is organized or, or basically made clear to the entire organization what to do and how to handle this situation. I think it's very important really that this is so basically, crisis management is, is something which is built in uh, and, 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 and it's very important for the leader and it's very important for all the entire uh, working force to, to know and be prepared for this. So, and that's basically encouraging uh, the, the, the making or, or, or having these uh, internal policies which regulate this and another thing, using emails, phone calls, paper calendars, everything, handling documents. Why? Because if this group of people <coughs> come in, they can actually take everything, everything. So they just go in a room, uh, lock your uh, boards in that, take everything and you cannot do anything again. So that means that this must discipline every, every each and every person in the organization to handle emails, uh, phones, phone messages, everything properly in a not a misleading way, a very responsible and careful way and this must be taught to, to everybody from the top managers to the most executing raw people. And this is also very important just that everybody has the responsibility and responsible people are selected for, for treating important procurement <laughs> issues and so on. So, I think it's very important to have these internal rules and teaching of these internal rules, monitoring the, the compliance with these internal rules. Otherwise, this will not work, so it's really not worth paying the money for, for these rules, paying lawyers or so, teaching people if it's not really in the organization and in the people's mind why it is necessary. And yes, because if you document everything, you can go back 10 years, 20 years, a dawn rate can go back towards 20 years and, and look at all your, and yeah, then, yes, then you have to remember 20 years backwards, what did I do on this and that date? And another thing, people must be uh, held and kept in an, as intelligent human beings. And they have to be warned that they really need to put notes, I'm not just not saying it because of the cartel, uh, but, but any other thing, on really material issues which are important uh, in connection with the certain decision makings which they are preparing and uh, which can be defended and justified for the purposes of the certain contract preparation or, or bidding or anything uh, because if it's misleading or if it's together with some other papers which can mislead that they were meeting with someone for the purposes of bribery and anything, then obviously this, this is the primary evidence. So everybody needs to treat every of its moment in the office and out of the office very carefully because otherwise you can get in trouble. Even plus now you have also the tools, the, the certain telephones and everything so it can even be recorded 
uh, even telephone calls can be recorded. Plus, what you have to be uh, very careful with is many times these informators and whistleblowers are just simply people there and they make uh, witness statements. So basically that you can obviously never. So you always have to uh, control how you are talking and what you are talking because it's also very important. And Okay, and thirdly, uh, what are the consequences of the down rate? So immediately you have a, a feedback in connection with the down rate because the authorities normally put these down rates on their websites, it's a public information. This anyway might cause a reputational uh, problem for the company and what can be the problem? Your business partners start to have discomfort with you and maybe your investors, consumers such a, uh, will, will, will also or might. So you have to also be prepared for this handle, calm them down on this as well. So that's also a very important issue what to be pre prepared for. Uh, the question is, that the last question I, I wanted to touch base is how to treat a manager uh, in connection with the activity of whom really uh, the, the, the cartel is established and there is a big fine. Normally a cartel brings a lot of uh, uh, profit to a company. That's why obviously the cartel members are doing this. But it's a short term. Uh, it's a short term uh, gain and, and for the purposes of really showing the, the uh, moral to the employees obviously, many instances it might be a, a good decision to, to <coughs> somehow detach from the particular uh, manager in these cases. Obviously uh, there are various levels, so it's normally not the top manager, but somebody on the lower level. And uh, although although it's not very crystal clear, but but maybe in these cases it's better to to say goodbye to, to those managers who are held liable in these. So basically, the lesson really, I think, how I can conclude what I say is really it's very important to always risk manage and re basically. Uh, you can never avoid as a manager, obviously, making uh, risky decisions every single day. Uh, it's something, a challenge, but uh, this must be really made in a way which is justified, documented, and can be tracked on a longer time so that really just the focus should be this long-term sustainability and not the short-term gain. Thank, Thank you. you. I have to say that I, I'm impressed by the diversity of approaches we could listen to uh, in this panel uh, on the maybe, maybe not type of approach uh, to the very specific advices you can get and also how unconventional sometimes uh, uh, the integrity management is and how much they work against certain kind of uh, of general perceptions. For example, the Indian case is shown, but India is sometimes mentioned as, as really a country where you cannot make business without corruption. And then we see that an internal company <coughs> can show the, uh, the best example to even the best international company. So isn't that really kind of, uh, of interesting and challenging, particularly when you want to translate it into an educational content. And I am particularly thankful to the panelists because they all showed that it's not just you know talk, but we really can turn it into some kind of educational material for MBA students and executives, and actually which is the, the best in this, that they are helping to do that. Now I open the floor for questions and comments. If there is any, I know, know the audience is getting a little bit exhausted. But the good news is that there is now only one more uh, presentation coming because we want to, to showcase two things. One is that uh, why business wants to cooperate with our center and with a business school at all. And two, what kind of specific outputs you can find and what is the impact of these outputs of the cooperation. So I will call uh, Laszlo Ciriak, who is a private equity fund manager of uh, Europe and who is also formerly the president of the American Chamber of Commerce Hungary and presently 
He is the chairman of the Committee on Governance and Transparency and the uh, MCHAM. And actually, we are cooperating now for eight years personally and about 10 years with the, uh, the business school in general. Laszlo? Uh, I promise to be very short. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to try to share with you why the American Chamber of Commerce wants to work with CU Business School, with CU University. Well, we want to work with academia because here is the future. Uh, we want to, the private sector wants to work with academia because the academia reaches to the public sector, the private sector, and to the NGO sector. And we want to make sure that you all, as the future leaders, have the skill sets and can understand right from wrong, the good, the bad, and can make those judgment calls. So what I want to do is tell you about what we've done so far in this partnership. Um, when CU Business School was founded, we started some things together. Uh, we created this position paper uh, on what is good governance. Peter, uh, uh, predecessor, was very much involved in this, and uh, CU Business School was very much involved. What we said there today still stands. Uh, we suggested that the Hungarian system adopt integrity into the uh, even the secondary school level, and now it's fortunately there. It's a requirement. Um, then we did a workshop where we invited business leaders to speak with academic leaders who would then take this content that they learned back to their schools and show their students what they learned. So what's missing, we discovered in long discussions with Peter and others, in academia is content and a network. Content and network for teaching and content and network <coughs> for research. So these workshops started, it's kind of a dialogue with trainers. Then we went further, we created a glossary. Uh, the professors said, well, we need a glossary, there's all this confusion on words, so we created one. Then we did a grant program, we encouraged uh, the teaching of corporate governance in universities. Then we had a board simulation, and, and Judith and Andras Hanak uh, up there was involved in writing uh, with CU a uh, board simulation, a real life simulation. Again, content to be used for teaching. We've taught this, at, or we've simulated this, play acted this at many places. And now we're working on, with uh, CU, uh, a case study competition to create more content. Uh, for teaching. So what's the impact we've achieved? Just some short <coughs> numbers. Uh, the Corporate Governance Workshop, it's been going for the eighth year. Tomorrow we're holding the eighth one. We've actually reached 166 unique professors with our content. I, I'm really proud of it. I, I even said, this can't be right. Can you go check? They checked. They double checked. It's 166 professors in Hungary we reached. And that's, that's great, 23 universities. So now we've given, the business community has given the academic community content to train for research to, to train the next generation. Board simulation, 36 professors, 13 universities, about 1,000 students. Some projects, nine universe, corporate governance grant program, nine universities, 12 professors, 500 students, publications, Several thousand people have seen it, not to mention the downloads. That's only physical copies. And the last slide is just, we're on a growth path. And thank you for letting us work with CU Business School. And we look, we look forward to working together on many more things. That's all I wanted to say. And uh, hope to see you guys soon. Thank you very much. Last
was amazing and, and quite surprising. The numbers speak almost for themselves. So, and I, I hope we will be able to continue this cooperation, not only with Amcham and you, but with all the other partners here and many beyond them. So maybe a, a last offering for the floor. Who would like to, uh, to make a comment or maybe a final very important question? Yeah, you are really exhausted and you, you deserve a break. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the panelists and thank you for Laszlo. And uh, before... You know that, uh, yeah, uh, before getting out of this, you know, lots of other work is behind this. Uh, there is a whole team of CEO business school staff uh, who contributed to this, and uh, we really just want to highlight two persons. One is Katalin Nagy, who is the coordinator of the center, and the other one is Veronika uh, uh, Kovac, who is the mastermind behind this whole series of 25th anniversary uh, workshop. Now, there is a reception and, and a, a, a buffet offer for those really uh, uh, enduring persons so who had the stamina to stay till the last minute. But there is, of course, no, no free lunch, no, no free dinner this time. There is also an art performance. The artists have been working on new ideas, on new, these little uh, gray and black and white uh, uh, cards in which you wrote your first associations on what is good, bad, transparency, integrity, and so on. So they created artworks. And they are eager to explain to you what is the relationship between what you see and our workshop because it will not it will be not so obvious so please devote about a few minutes just to go there and, and see them while you are eating or before or after but don't miss that either thank you very much for your patience.